Okay, here we go. And yeah, good morning, Dr. R. Michael Fisher here and Fear Talk 18. I've been doing this for about almost five years now and I bring guests on to have a discussion really about the topic of fear. And why do I do that is because fear is one of those things that often, even though a lot of us experience it, it's one of the things that's sort of the elephant in the room. You don't always get to actually focus on it and talk about it. And I think I see a lot of agreement from my host today, my guest today, I'm hosting here. Um, guest from, you're in Pennsylvania, Dr. Barb Stengel. Could you introduce yourself very briefly? Sure, I'd be happy to, Michael. I'm a longtime philosopher and teacher and teacher educator. So I worked for 25 years at Millersville University in Pennsylvania, part of the state system in Pennsylvania, and then spent the last 10 years, active years of my teaching career at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, very interesting, by the way, uh, comparison between a state university and a, a, a private elite university. But um, I have been focused, my day job, I say, it has to do with teachers and teacher education, helping folks figure out how to um, how to truly educate in a, a world where, frankly, uh, our educational policies are getting in the way of education. They're pushing us to sort of shrink down what we are asking kids to think about and feel and do in the world. But um, anyway, teacher, teacher, educator, philosopher, long interest in fear, uh, published some stuff, but more importantly, spent some time teaching about fear. And that'll be relevant for today's session, as you'll see. Indeed, thank you very much for joining me. Um, I'm an on I'm honored, really, because uh, we are both the same age, and we're both have taken courses, and you know, we never dropped into education first. It kind <laughs> of came upon us, and uh, I think uh, in reading your work, uh, Barb, over the last few years, really two years, I've been looking at your work because um, I didn't discover you for all those other years. Interestingly enough. And I always kept thinking, why is it I have such an attraction here? I'm not a Dewey in, you know, John mm -hmm. Dewey in mm -hmm. scholar like you are. And, but I think it is because we actually had different careers. We had different interests prior to coming in to mm -hmm. education proper as a mm -hmm. discipline. Mm -hmm. And I got a feeling that that keeps us a little bit on the same plane. So today. You may well be right. Yeah. Today in a non-disciplinary focused discussion on fear talk, really inter and transdisciplinary in a wide broad approach to fear and education. I'm gonna introduce us as if we were starting a class co-teaching. So just for everybody in the audience, here's the course. Oh. Ed Foundation's course. Okay, oh, this is my dream course. Mm. Art, science, and morality of fear. So you can hear the different disciplinary areas, right? Art, science, and morality of fear in education proper. So here we go. Um, we're going to focus on teaching and learning because we've just got a class, you and I, we just opened the door, students are coming in class of pre-service teachers. This is something you're very familiar with, Barb. Yep. And so we're gonna introduce, how would we introduce a course like that? Just as building really the architecture for learning and thinking mm -hmm. in that first 15 minutes of a class when you walk in. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna just start, I'll spin, you spin, and I'll, we'll just give each other these little sectors of introducing and warming up this class. And I that really am thinking on warming up. So basically, I'm right now talking to everybody in the class and saying, we're here to warm up first. That's the first thing I'd say. We're here to warm up first. Just like when you do exercises and you're going to go and do something hard. What does a good phys ed coach tell you as Barb Stengel? It was a, yep. <laughs> a basketball yep. coach in phys ed. I know she knows. What do you do first? Why do you warm up first, Barb? Um, you warm up first, and this matches the very best of learning theory as we know it. I'm thinking about um, 
the the uh, twenty year old work, how people learn, that try to tries to summarize basically what we know about learning science, and it comes down to a couple really simple things. One is that you have to activate what is already known, what is prior experience. You've got to bring that to the fore, and the second part of it is that you um, that you have to focus on participation. That you have to bring our students, you folks, uh, we have to bring our students into the conversation in a way that you can um, resonate with it, process it, get fully activated by it. And so those two things, the prior knowledge and the participation, um, are really why we want to warm up and why we invite you in. And if we don't make that connection, we're dead in the water. Nothing's going to happen after that. Oh, I love it. So this is a social connection. I'm going to use that. That's what I'm teaching right now. I'm doing this warm up for social connection, sometimes called communal practice, sometimes called the social practice, and ultimately a moral practice. So I want everybody in the classroom right now to get up out of your seats and walk back out the door. Mm. Barb and I are going to wait here. We've just given you an invitation to come into a class it's an education foundations course in the disciplined faculty of education. And we want you to walk back in consciously thinking about we're walking into a course about social practices. Come on back in. So out you go. Come on, walking back in. Everything I've read about, so I'm introducing right now, they've just sat down. I want to introduce Barb a little bit as I understand her. What I think is so interesting about her approach to education is that she puts social practice and moral practice that goes with that before education. That's my view of what she does. Mm -hmm. When I actually watch how she architecture of everything she does, and I haven't been in her classrooms, you build an architecture for social practice, which you just said, you have to meet people where they're at, how they're participating socially, then we're preparing ourselves for what we've called learning and teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have a little formula I'm just going to share. This is my little bit of, you know, 45 years experience advice as a teacher to all you new teachers out there, which completely can be challenged. Please challenge it during this course as we're teaching. Barb might challenge it. And then she might offer her own quick, you know, spin off of my advice. And my advice is, Take the first 20% of the time of every course lesson you teach. Take the first 20% of the, the time on, on building a social space, a moral space of practice. In other words, give your students 20% of the time to warm up with all of us. Barb. Um, you know, I, I don't disagree with that, Michael, um, although I think I would be a little less uh, um, inclined to mark off the warm up. And when it moves out of warm up into drills now, I have I am now coaching actually third and I mean, fourth grade basketball. So I mean, and that's a hoot. I mean, that's hysterical. Um, but what I know as a coach um, from a fairly long career as a, as a mostly basketball, a little bit, a few other sports, um, you know, you're you're always building in any educational experience. And it doesn't matter whether it's a course, as we are imagining we're doing here, or an individual lesson that is a one encounter, whether it's 45 minutes or 20 minutes or, you know, a day and a day long you're always building towards something that you want people to know and be able to do, to um, be able to enact at the end of the lesson, the course, the practice. So in a practice, we spend time doing um, certain kinds of drills and activities that are truly warm up, but they segue very naturally and seamlessly into other kinds of drills that get more and more complicated, more and more situated in this social practice that Michael's talking about. 
And so we're building up to usually in, a, in an athletic practice to some sort of scrimmage at the end of the game, to some sort of um, practice like situation where all the pieces that we've pulled together can be enacted. They, they can be put together in a product, in a, and so I, I hesitate. I'm not a person who thinks you have to have a product at the end of a lesson. I'm much more open-ended than that. Nonetheless, I do think that you, you plan towards that product, knowing that you cannot control exactly what kids are going to take with them or adults in this case are going to take with them or exactly how it will be taken up and knowing that, you know, the next time we come together, that warm up, by the way, is a warm up not just for them, but for me too, because I've got to tease out, okay, you went away from me a week ago and here you are back. And I've got to figure out what you actually did take with you, if anything, at the end of the last lesson or the last two lessons, so that I can figure out. I have a plan for today, of course. I think I know what that is, but I may not be right. So some of the warm up is, in fact, all about letting me know what to take up. You know, I, and I just love this analogy as we keep expanding this, and we're yeah. just we're just spinning this off unrehearsed. Is that I think of two things as I think of you're inviting the team to make you a better coach. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you want to be so informed. So keep informing me students, players, yes. keep yes. informing me and I will keep feeding back to you. You keep feeding back to me. And what I really like about the analogy is because we have a common game to play mm -hmm. at the end. A common goal, right. Whether Absolutely. it's at the end of the class, mm -hmm. And it'd be nice to even, you know, be able to even give bits of ideas to the students before you start a class. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of thinking we might end up here, but we might not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the, the kids, the students, and this are pre-service teachers, they're going, oh, 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 so we actually are going to a game. We're actually going to even do a pre-game play, mm -hmm. like you said, mm -hmm. even if it's a practice game. Mm -hmm for a bigger game. Oh, well, what's the bigger game, Dr. Fisher, or Dr. Singa? What's the bigger game? The game of life. Mm -hmm. Always. Always. And so now, Barb, we come to why are we doing a course on fear? Mm -hmm. Why is it in 2014, Dr. Barb Stengel was in Shanghai giving a conference talk to a bunch of philosophers, I believe, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. she titled that talk Fear is dangerous, the philosophical case of fearless for fearless education. Why on earth would you do that? <laughs> really? So let's let's just dive in. It seems to me that there are um that if we imagine this course as being about facing fear, sure. um that there are, and I'm gonna do a little play on words here, one part of what I think we need to do, and I'm just giving you the preview, is to look at the faces of fear. That is, what does fear look like in our modern world, um, postmodern world, very complicated world, um, especially after the year 2000, uh, after the year 2000, that how have has our world changed? So putting Putting a face on that, figuring out how that looks for me, for us, for our as, as educators, for our students. What is the experience of living in the world that is shot through with fear today? And we have to look at that. The second aspect that I think we have to do is a truly philosophical analysis. And I would employ both what folks call analytic strategies as well as um, phenomenological strategies and um, certainly historical views of fear, but really analyzing from a philosophical point of view, what is this thing? And that's a good bit of the work that you've done, Michael, I know, in trying to say, here's what fear means, here's why it's meaningful, here's how we can live in some sense that is fear-free, fear-less, we can talk about what words to use. Right, right. But the third aspect of this, it seems to me, actually is facing fear. So as a person in the world, and 
I don't mean as an individual, as if I were an atomistic individual. I mean a fully formed social person in the world whose self-understanding is has been created by my interactions with my family, my loved ones, my friends, my colleagues, etc. Um, how can we figure out what to do about fear? And I would argue, and this is why this really fits with art, science, morality, and, and fear, that the the wisdom, what I call the wisdom traditions of the world, which many people would call religions, but I would expand it to include um, some practices that not everybody would call religion, like Wicca, Native American practices, etc. They all they all offer us wisdom about fear. The Christian scriptures are the greatest example because the most common phrase in Christian scriptures is be not afraid. What's that about? Where's that coming from? And what, what do these wisdom traditions have to offer us? So I want to suggest a sort of Trinitarian approach here. All right. Faces of fear. What's the experience of it? What are the facets from a philosopher's point of view? What do we need to think about and know about? And then finally, okay, so what do we do? How do we face that fear? And then the pragmatic approach, the pragmatist approach, critical pragmatist or applied practical pragmatist, um, we're really in a sense sort of saying that it's gotta be experimental. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. guess what? You have just now joined the fear lab. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a three hour tutor per week on this course, there's the lecture part. And we're just gonna introduce, we're gonna have a tutoring part where you can go to a lab two to three hours a week. There'll be a grad student there and you're actually going to get the chance to experiment in facing fear. Mm -hmm. Just like a chemistry lab, just like a biology lab, just like a sports training, you've got to have places to practice. So I love this idea of practicing fear is as important as managing fear. Mm -hmm. There's a tendency mm -hmm. in our managerial functionalist society and the philosophy of functionalism, right? Pro that kind of get down, organize it, get the result you want kind of thinking like the functionalist produces mm -hmm. into the other part of what's your experience of it before you start to try to manage it. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of facing it as if I was painting a portrait of it day to day, experimentally, what's it like now? What's it like in that situation? What's it like in that situation? Some situations I might feel very courageous and fearless even. Mm -hmm. Put me in another one in 10 seconds and boom, I'm like in super distress, really terrified because of whatever that situation is. So I think the pragmatist that we approach that I understand with you and Dewey's work is mm -hmm. when it's social, it's environmental. Mm -hmm. And there, so we've got now the individual, here's my little trinity of what I want us as teachers to think about in this course, individual, social mm -hmm. practice, and then this experimental field of those mm -hmm. mixing and the environment itself. Mm -hmm. The I, the mm -hmm. we, and mm -hmm. the it. The I, the we, and the it. Let's always think holistically. Let's think of integrating constantly those. What I liked about Barb Stengel's work on moral education when you did that first book with Al, uh, Alan. Alan, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just looking at it the other day, 2006, and uh, what I like about your approach is you said, I want to look at the field. We want to look at the field of moral education practices related to schooling and education. But you said, I want to look at this whole spectrum of how does it show in different categories? Mm -hmm. I think those were like faces. You were mm -hmm. like putting yes. faces on moral education practices right. as they were evolving in the culture of America, I think, in the last 25 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And you were just collecting everything that sort of fit that face everyone that fit that and you called them categories mm -hmm. and then in the end you sort of had the spectrum one to five of these different faces of fear and you said well you can kind of approach fear education moral education i'm making the analogy mm -hmm. here with fear mm -hmm. education and we could kind of get a student you know what a great thing for a student an administrator anybody a leader a teacher to have the spectrum of possibilities for making 
faces mm -hmm. for fear. Mm -hmm. So we're not just making up faces for fear, just purely experiential from my point of view. Right, right. Oh my gosh, give me that spectrum. That's the wisdom. You were like collecting the wisdom as far as mm -hmm. I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And then you start to say at the end and you can start to make choices. But you said something else very important, both of you, in the last few paragraphs. We don't yet have a common language for the moral education yes. course. Yes. So let's yes. talk about common language for this course on fear. Yeah. Is there any it. thoughts about how do we get that common language? Because we all are going to have our differences, right? And difference is so important. Everybody has differences. Sometimes those differences conflict. So where would be, how would you do that in your classes when you taught this facing fear? I know you took a, I think mm -hmm. you taught a course on mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Michael, I, I, I think you are right that we need a common language in order to make progress, but it is also true that by making progress, we will develop a common language. In other words, this is sort of a dialectic. It's not a one directional thing, exactly. Perfect, I love the dialectic. Yeah, so, so on the one hand, um, I would begin to point out some of the differences in language, the way people use the term affect, the way they use the term fear, the way they use the term emotion generally. Yeah. Um, affect, feeling, emotion. Okay. How that applies to fear. And then and then come to understand that sometimes the different usages are based in the purpose of the discipline that has developed the language. So psychologists, mm. especially experimental psychologists, by and large, um, have a certain way of thinking about emotions. Um and but that's not necessarily what philosophers will do. And it's not necessarily what is of use when we are thinking about facing fear, whether from a religious perspective, an existential perspective, or from an edu educative or uh, teaching type perspective. And so I think, well, I, what do you think? I think I would start with this, the, the language and the way the disciplines, the purpose for using the language impacts what the terms mean and how those terms are used. Yeah, because, and I think mostly what I discovered in my 35 years of studying fear is that there's a, there's what we call a hegemony or a dominant discourse. There's a dominant way of thinking and kind of collecting a conceptualization of what it is we're studying. So fear has been usurped and usurped means basically it's been taken over by because it, it came from our no wisdom and knowledge came from cultures, mm -hmm. from theologies, from philosophy, right. primarily. Right. That's right. where the roots of our understanding of the fear experiencing mm -hmm. was conceptualized. And then we figured out, well, we want to manage that better or whatever we wanted to do, understand it better. And then at some point, probably only a couple of hundred years ago, if not even less, psychology took over fear many yeah. people argued this anthropologists are pissed off about it you know right. cultural right. theorists are pissed off about it philosophers because psychology why was it so successful mm -hmm. in taking over this understanding of fear so virtually i basically say if you want to study fear during this course find one fear book so i'm telling all the students now find one book on fear that you want to read your own choice mm -hmm. Just find one that specializes on fear. And I'll guarantee you when we come together, I could be wrong, most of it's going to be about the psychology of fear mm -hmm. of the individual. Yeah. 95, 6%. I think you're right about that. Yeah. And it's very individualistic. I mean, the idea that seems to be have created the dominant mode or the has the hege hegemonic position, as you put it, is that the notion that Fear is, uh, if not an instinct, a capacity for instinct built in to the individual. And that individual, my the fear, is mine, but it has the same, um, the, the physiological aspects of it are common across all humans, but the fear itself 
only I exper experience. And I think, you know, we, I think both you and I would want to call all of that into question, not to challenge what psychologists are doing in a narrow experimental format, but to broaden and widen our understanding of what fear is and how it functions in our lives um, and how we construct it in our social interactions as well. So I, um, you know, I, I don't want to downplay the psychology. I think you're right. That's the dominant talk. And yet it's so limited. So John Dewey was kind of a really good example because we're all educators in this room. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we know a little bit about John Dewey as we ought to, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the field of education. He brought psychology and philosophy into a very nice, as, as did William James mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. some others mm -hmm. in our American history here, uh, but brought it together in a really good way. He didn't literally let one or the other take over as my guess. And, and I think that's an attitude we want in this class. Yes. Even if you really like the psychology of fear stuff, and if maybe somebody's going to go, I like the anthropology of fear. Another person may go, I like the physiology of fear. I want to get mm -hmm. into the neurobiology yes. of it. Yes. And so in this course, we're saying, go for it. Go for it. Dive into any of those that you want. Mm -hmm. And bring them back as part of players on the table. Fear is going to be on this big table. And no one discipline, no one preference mm -hmm. is going to be included. And I think you called that integrated mm -hmm. in your understanding in, of we were talking moral, about moral education yeah. types or classifications. I'm an I call myself an yeah. integralist, mm -hmm. which is really just another version of holistic. Gotcha. And, and so it's just a little more complex than holistic. Don't need to go into that now, but we'll talk about that. So what I kept saying is. We have to be as interested in the knowledge of fear mm -hmm. as fear itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a, the physiological experience, there is a physiological experience, it seems to me, that gives rise to our being willing to talk about or put this kind of terminology on that physiological experience. But an example I use often, and let's go back to our sports here. Um, or theater or whatever, sure. if you're a performer of some kind, because we're here talking about art, science, morality of fear. Um, when you are ready for a game, you are generally excited. There is an excitation, as Dewey would talk about it, um, that in sports we call being psyched up. Mm -hmm. Now, what we also know is you can get too psyched up. And I would argue that the if you're not psyched up enough, you're just not going to have the energy the in motion, emotion, energy in motion that you need to play top quality basketball or whatever it is, or to do a, a wonderful performance on the on the stage. If you have too much energy in motion, it can get in your way. It can stop you. You can actually, instead of just shooting that nice feathery uh, jump shot, you're banging the backboard with the ball because you have too much energy going through you. We are, and Aristotle understood this, we're looking for that right, you know, psyched up, but not psyched out. Now, in my um, experience, we can think about fear as crossing the line being psyched out and withdrawing. And if you withdraw, you are afraid. Whereas if you stay with it, if you move into it, if you are attracted to the challenge, it's a positive emotion. It We can call it interest, we can call it excited, we can call it ready to play. But fear is that thing that takes that same instinctual kind of excitement and turns it into something destructive. and. That that fights a lot of what the psychologists suggest about fear in this sense, that it's not a basic emotion. It's not that there's only one, there, there are just six, I think they usually say, basic emotions. There aren't just six ways of getting excited. There is, and this is Dewey, and there is one kind of excitement, one kind of excitation in the body. And that excitation can move into all kinds of 
emotional interactions, words that, uh, that we're able to put on, and this is the pragmatist part, that we can tell the difference based on the outcome. So if I flee, if I run away, if I avoid, I'm afraid. But I could have similar excitation and move towards it, engage in the game or the play or the whatever it is, the lesson, and that's not fear. And people say, well, yeah, I, I am afraid, but I'm doing it anyway. I've conquered fear. And I would say, no, actually, you're not afraid. You're excited. You're interested. You're moving towards it. Um, now, that's a, you know, this is a stretch for outside of most people's way of thinking about it. But I think it's useful educationally, Michael, because it helps me as a teacher to know when my students come afraid, afraid to talk about race in a difficult class, yeah. afraid of mathematics, for instance. I mean, these are very common fears playing out in classroom settings. When they come and I recognize fear because of their avoidance, it tells me a little something about what I have to do. I may have to either um, lower the excitement level, tell them, okay, the stakes are not that high. It's going to be all right. Let's everybody breathe a little bit to, in order to get them not too excited. So they don't cross into, you know, overexcited. So you students, you're, you got a little bit of a lecture from us. You got a bit of our sense of where we're coming from. And now we'd like to ask you some things. Barb, in teaching this, what, what would you now probably do to get the students to, to come forward? What kind of, would you use a questionnaire about mm -hmm. something, draw some knowledge from them now to put on the table. We have about five minutes left here. So yeah. let's just explore that. And I also, with that, we really need to deal with the word fearless because, you know, you just sort of talked about yes. good fear and yes. sort of not so good of fear, the shrinking and the withdrawing. But then you use this word fearless, which I use fearlessness. Yes, um, you do. That's going to be a very complex conversation. We don't have time for fully, but can we even just touch on that? So what does fearless mean to you or why would you provocatively? Well, the first thing you got to do always, Michael, and you know, this is you got people, you have to get people to name their experience of fear. And so we can do that through some sort of questionnaire. I, I often just ask them to draw a picture using crayons of cool. a, a time, a, an experience that they would say, no, this is fear. And so you have people with snakes in the pictures and people with heights and people with other kinds of very basic, you know, I don't like this claustrophobia is mine. Um, in order to say, okay, but what about, once we get those things on the table, then we have something to chew on. Now, fearlessness may be where we're going, but it sure as shooting is not where we're gonna start because people just do have experiences of fear. Now, I have encountered a few people who it seems to me look sort of fearless. Um, and I think of myself as a person who, um, for the most part, I grew up so secure and so supported um, that that security gave me a place to stand so that that's not to say that something things don't excite me. If I get a bat in my house, I'm going to get excited about it, but I may or may not get afraid. Like if it's a bat, what do I do? Well, I say it's a bat. What do I know about bats? What can I do about it? My daughter and I got a bat out of the house with a tennis racket one time. Um, or if I avoid it, I really am afraid. If I call my son who lives down the alley and say, can you come up here and get rid of this bat, please? Then I'm afraid. And the very first thing we have to do to get to a, I think, to get to a place that's fearless is to recognize what the faces of fear are, what the triggers are, what are the ways that we might become um, uh, impacted by the insecurity that very much is part of our world today. And it shows up in culture wars and other kinds of things that we're you know, trying to wrap our heads around. You know, it's one of the things that we talked about very early on is that uh, why we were kind of, I think fear is such an important topic. I guess it's we only one way we could kind of say that because in a sense, students are sitting there, why fear? Why not love? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you do a course on the art, mm -hmm. science, and morality of love and mm -hmm. education? I don't do that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I could, uh, and I've had to compete with uh, the education circles and many people and, you know, the, the caring and the philosophers and noddings and so on. You know, there tends to be that direction toward the good, the virtuous, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And I think uh, fear is just probably is an important of a, in a sense, I don't want to say a virtue itself, but it, it's an intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's like the experiencing and this complexity that it's inter intertwined with mm -hmm. in the human organismic, all living organisms. It's so vital to our intelligence. And all I want to do is give it a little bit more valuation mm -hmm. under this. Just a little, just a little air time, right. A little, a little air time, time in, in concrete kinds of ways that, no, I think you're right. And certainly as an educator over a long period of time, it became clear to me that fear is what stops us. It's fear is what makes education not possible. Hard stop. If you're afraid, nothing's going, nothing good's going to happen. Um, and as a result, it's worth our attention, especially in the kinds of schools that I've worked in, mostly in urban settings with yeah. kids who are disadvantaged. Yes. Yes. That yes. They have very good reasons for being insecure and or afraid. Yep. And so we have to help them deal with that. But more than that, we have to deal with it. We have to understand what our own insecurities are. Yeah. So I, I definitely come from more of that we're working class background myself uh mm -hmm. when you you know luxuriate around your support that you had growing up and going into careers and stuff and I think that's re really intriguing to me that you had taken a path to also recognize fear as being mm -hmm. important even when in some sense you didn't yeah. really have it to. didn't it didn't apply didn't to me in many ways in not not in that deep way that it, but I it think probably others. as an educator getting into the classrooms and watching what happens is when there's a ton of fear in this classroom every moment and then never mind with the kids that those pre-service and service teachers are having to deal with so that ends our time today on this wonderful fear talk with you barb anything you just want to last minute say how is this for you uh, i love talking about this 